Good evening. Welcome to the Green Local School District Board of Education meeting for October. This is Snowberger. Would you call the roll, please? Mr. Campbell? No. Here. Mr. Herdlick? Here. Mrs. Stoinoff? Here. Mrs. Finelli? Here. Mr. Cohen? Here. Well, Joel, please, please <laughs> rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We'll move right into the honors and recognition. Mr. Miller. All right. At this time, can I please have Mr. Shank come forward? Good evening, everyone. I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Charlotte uh, Wittensoldner is uh, Greenwood Student of the Month for October. She is the daughter of Adam and Jamie and her classroom teacher who is here tonight, Mrs. Flutterjohn. Uh, Charlotte's favorite things to do are to draw, run, and swim. Her favorite color is pink, and uh, favorite food is grilled cheese. Her favorite thing about school is going outside, and when she grows up, she wants to be a, a doctor. That yeah. a girl. <laughs> Mrs. Flutterjohn had this to say about Charlotte. Charlotte is a perfect example of being bulldog strong. She's a hard worker, kind to her friends, and an all-around great uh, student. This, uh, this year, Green was focusing on three rules, be kind, be safe, and be responsible. And Charlotte is a great model of those three rules. So if you could please put your hands together for Charlotte. <laughs> Congratulations. Next up, can I please have Mrs. Seals from Green Primary? You want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Okay. My name is Colin. <laughs> Marquise. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Colin Marquise is our GPS October Student of the Month. He's joined here this evening by mom and dad, and also Carter, who is also a GPS student, who is in? Mrs. C. Sobers. <laughs> All right, Colin has big goals, as he would like to someday be either a professional basketball player or baseball player, as well as possible, possibly a weatherman or meteorologist. Colin's favorite subject at GPS is gym and math, because he's good at both. His favorite thing to do at GPS is, or his favorite thing about G GPS is how nice all the teachers are. Colin's favorite activities outside of school are playing sports, riding my bike, swimming, and playing video games. One interesting fact about Colin that others might not know is that, do you remember what you said? <laughs> Dustin Johnson, the number one golfer in the world, gave Colin a golf ball at the Bridgestone Tournament. Nice. No way. It's pretty cool. Colin's best advice for others is to treat others the way you want to be treated. Take your time and slow down. Colin's teachers had to say that Colin comes to school every day with a smile on his face. He brings energy to the classroom with, with his enthusiasm towards learning. He is kind, responsible, and respectful to his classmates and teachers. We are very proud of Colin. Congratulations. All right, job well done. Next up, can I have Mr. Booth, Green Intermediate School? Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure for me tonight to introduce our GIS Student of the Month, Natalie Nero. She is a sixth grader in Mrs. Sears, Mrs. Hamilton, Mrs. Brooks, and Mr. Mostoff's room. She is here tonight with Sarah and Ronald, her parents. Uh, she also has a brother, an eighth grade brother named Eli, and a fourth grade brother named Logan. So Natalie shares a special bond uh, with her parents. 
as they took her home from the hospital um, and adopted her after a year and a half and called her a part of their family. Uh, this was a very important time in her life um, as her parents poured love and caring uh, into her over the years. She attributes her success in school and her life to them and she said that they are my support when needed and are always there for me to talk to. Uh, she knows and understands how special they are and Natalie, I do believe you are here and a great leader and student of the month because of what they uh, have poured into you. So congratulations. Natalie, also's favorite subject in school are digital literacy and math. Uh, she grew up with her dad's love of technology and she calls her brother the human computer or human calculator. Uh, and so she gets math from him as well. Uh, Natalie herself is a very strong math student and is in the advanced math program uh, in sixth grade. Natalie is not only talented in school, she's also talented in the arts. She has played in the band for the past two years and has been a part of the GIS choir for the past three years, and she truly has a love for music. Outside of school, Natalie's quite an actress. Uh, she has taken the stage at Theater 815 uh, last winter in Hamlin Town and was Pick a Little Lady in a Music Man last spring at GIS. Uh, Natalie has been a Girl Scout since she was in first grade and loves camping trips and spending time with her friends. She plans to obtain a degree in zoology and hopefully study in Brazil, she said. Additionally, she uh, has set her sights on playing professionally in an orchestra. Her teacher, Mrs. Sears, says these, uh, this thing, these comments about Natalie. Natalie is a hard worker and very caring towards her peers. She wants to take on the next challenge and put forth her best efforts always. Natalie is always looking for others and helping others. So Natalie, you're a great leader. We are very proud of you at GIS. So please help me congratulate Natalie Nero. Congratulations. Next up, Mr. Wells, Green Middle School. Good evening, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce our student of the month at Green Middle School. It's Jack Zarnicki. And the one thing about Jack is that he's an eighth grader at GMS, and he is the son of Russell and Denise. And he has his brother David with him here as well, who's a student at GIS. In talking to Jack, he plays basketball at G GMS, and it's something he'd like to continue when he gets to the high school. He's also an active member of the Boy Scouts. And in the summer months, he really enjoys swimming in the pool. Mom and Dad, I think that's, he says he likes that. Uh, he also, typical middle school student, enjoys video games. And um, again, that's not uncommon for, for the middle school crowd. Um, in terms of talking about what he would like to do after school, Jack was kind of undecided what he would like to study, but he would like to attend the Ohio State University uh, when he's done high school. So he's looking forward to that. And here's what Jack's teachers had to say, and I, I think it goes for all the students that are students of the month tonight. I think it's really impressive how early these students stand out in the school year. I think it says it's something special about all of them that are here, and uh, Jack's, Jack's no different. Here's what his teachers had to say. Jack says, it's a pleasure to have in class. He gives 100% every day in every subject. Jack is the definition of character and integrity. His effort, kindness, and leadership are top notch. He truly works hard every day, not only in his academics, but as a role model for his peers. GMS is bulldog proud to call him our own. That's from his teacher. So again, could you help me congratulate Jack as our student of the month. This is Brown Green High School. <laughs> Good evening. It's my pleasure to introduce the seniors of the month, beginning with Mr. Matt Amison. Matthew is the son of Brian and Laura, and he has a sister, Miranda. He has played baseball and football all four years at Green High School. He's a member of the Maranatha Bible Church and has participated in the Junior Leadership Akron program. Matt plans to study biology and play football at the University of Dayton or Youngstown State, and he plans to go to dental school after receiving his bachelor's degree. So please congratulate Matthew Amison. Our second
second senior of the month is Miss Madison uh, Bowser, and she is the daughter of Heather and Jeff Bowser, sister of Colin, and owner of the dog of her dog, Lola. Uh, she's a member of the National Honor Society and has received Academic Scholar Award each year of her high school career. She's our editor-in-chief of the Paw Print, which is our Green High School student newspaper, and a member of the students of our school's select choir. She spends most of her free time as a student athletic trainer and is a student ambassador. She's planning on attending Walsh University in the fall to study exercise science and pre-physical therapy. So congratulations to Madison. Congratulations to all of our students of the month and thank you family and friends for the support that you provide them and the trust you put in green schools. At this point, uh, we're gonna shift into the spotlight on staff, which is where we recognize our staff members. So if I could have the following individuals, please come forward. Elaine Mellinger, Amy Halverson, and Sue Brogan. All right, so these three uh, fine individuals were nominated. Uh, we take nominations from parents, community, staff, peers, administrators, you name it, and we look over and then we make our decisions. So tonight, I'm gonna start with Elaine, who is standing here. She was nominated, and I'm gonna read uh, briefly from one of the nominations that she received. I told her that she wouldn't have to make a speech that way, so. <laughs> So Elaine is an ex excellent paraprofessional at Green High School. She's been nominated for this award because she exemplifies what it truly means to be a team player. From the moment she steps into the hallways at Green High School until the moment she leaves, she gives her heart and soul for each and every student that she works with. Her positive and caring nature is truly appreciated as she works with some of our most challenging situations Elaine goes above and beyond the call of duty by volunteering to attend school dances, after school events, so that all the students are able to participate. So this is from um, your colleagues at Green High School. Thank you, Elaine, for all that you do. Great job, thank you. And next up we have Sue Brogan. Uh, her nomination read that she's an absolutely amazing person, a true asset to the Green Local Schools. She serves as, as a behavior coach for the district, working with some of the most challenging and difficult behaviors in the classroom. She supports teachers and provides them with positive intervention supports for students in order for them to be successful. Uh, Never has anybody seen Stu give up on a student, which is a true testament, as she's constantly thinking of how else she can help, what else can she do to support both the students and staff. She's truly amazing, and I honestly don't know what we would do without her. And um, this went on, one of our administrators wrote, Mrs. Seals, that she's had the pleasure of working with Sue both at the middle school and now the primary building, and she is just outstanding. She said that the school wouldn't function nearly the same without her ongoing support. So thank you and congratulations, Sue. <laughs> and finally, Amy joined our food service team back in 2012, immediately distinguishing herself as an employee with personal accountability and a stellar work ethic. Over the next three years, her outstanding performance led her to be selected as the cook manager at Green Intermediate School. Since her promotion in 2015, she's been instrumental in improving the GIS kitchen in several different ways. Her creativity is on display and with the newly decorated kitchen area, new menu items, and fresh recipes on old classics. She's upbeat and energetic, and she has a renewed commitment by her staff to an improved customer service standard. These in, in, improvements have had such a direct impact on the overall numbers of students that we see in the kitchen as well. And right now, there's been an increase this year, uh, we tabulated, of over 1,000 lunches sold from this exact time last year, which is huge. Um, she is a Green Bulldog employee and a mom to two Green Bull, Bulldog students, Emma and Lucas. Please help me recognize Amy for all that she does. Alright, 
Congratulations, thank you. Congratulations to all our recipients this evening. Uh, for those of you who uh, weren't planning on spending the entire evening with us for, for the rest of the meeting, if you want to uh, gather your stuff, we'll give you a few minutes to, uh, to head out to the back and then we'll continue on. I can't believe everybody leaves. <laughs> 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 right. Yeah, I think they knew that your presentation was tonight. <laughs> I can't believe Wendell actually showed me. what he was presenting tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Wendell usually has a yes. reason not to yeah. come to this. Yeah, the other crowd can be. I'm going to say it's that one time when he announced that. Right. <laughs> Stream it out. There's still plenty of time to get to the meeting <laughs> for 80s forecast. Is that the, the girl that you know? Mm -hmm. As everybody finishes making their way out, we'll uh, continue on with the uh, with the agenda for this evening. Speaking of it, the approval of the agenda. We don't have any uh, addendum items for the agenda, so do I have a motion to approve the agenda as printed? So moved. Second. That was Sally with it? Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Finelli and Mr. Cohen. Mrs. Snowberger? Mrs. Finelli? Yes. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Mr. Campbell? Yes. Mr. Herdlick? Yes. Mrs. Stoinoff? Yes. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. We have no need for executive session uh, this evening at this time. Um, anyone who is uh, here to speak on just behalf of the agenda items. Uh, if you want to make yourself forward, nothing on the agenda itself. There'll be room for public comments if it's not about the agenda items here in the end of the meeting. Um, seeing none, we'll move forward with the superintendent treasure report with five-year forecast. Mrs. Snowberger. Okay. Um, just as a review, we um, have to turn in a five-year forecast twice a year to the Ohio Department of Education. Um, this will be the last year that it's due by October 31st. Um, starting next year, the first submission will be at the end of November. Um, this has been a push among treasurers for a really long time um, because it's really hard to know if you have um, any, any kind of levies on the ballot, if they pass or not. Um, it changes the forecast for those districts quite a bit. So they finally listened a little bit and they've moved it to November. And the second submission will remain in May. It's due at the end of May, like, like in the past. Um, so the first slide I have up here is, and I made handouts for this whole big crowd, um, <laughs> is just so you could see, um, I just thought I'd put a little more visuals in this year, just to see where the revenues and expenses, how they play out. Um, this will also be in Julie's annual report as well um, that she put together. But as you can see, the dark blue, the green, and the little sliver of orange, those are the three um, pots of money that come from real estate only. Um, the green, it says property tax allocation for the 7%. That's the um, rollback in Homestead that the state pays back the 12.5% that homeowners get the tax break for. And the other big part is the yellow sliver, and that's the state aid, which we call our school foundation payment. Um, and and if, you, if you look at the math when you get your handouts, you can see the numbers a little bit better. Those two categories alone are 94% of all the revenue that the school district brings in. So 62%, um, like I said earlier, is real estate collections. Um, all levies approved before 1978 are continuous levies in all school districts. It's not just green. Every school district had a set of levies that were passed in 1976 and in 1978. And after 1978, they combined those um, and made them continuous for every school district. Um, so our, our, those levies we have are 24.99 mills. Um, and they bring in approximately $15 million to the district for um, operating expenses. We also have two emergency levies. Um, the one is slated to end at the end of 2019, the calendar year. And that one is a $4.1 million emergency levy. 
And we also have a $4.8 million levy that will expire at the end of 2021. Um, it would go without saying that I, I would recommend to the board to seek renewal for these two emergency levies, um, but it is up to the Board of Education to put those on the ballot. Um, but it's over 35% of our revenue for expenses at this point. We have um, some other levies that aren't part of the forecast. Um, the forecast, five-year forecast is only for um, the general fund for the day-to-day -day expenses of a district. Um, we have a $4.8 million levy um, that is a continuous levy and it's a permanent improvement fund. We have a one mil um, safety and security levy that we just passed this past August. And we also have a 2.28 mil levy, which is our bond issue that will actually expire at the end of 2019 and that will not be renewed. That was our building project that we had. Um, those three levies, they all are housed in different funds. They all are restricted and they can only be used for specific purposes. So continuing the permanent improvement levy can only be used for um, projects that last five years or more. Obviously, um, we've talked a lot about the safety and security levy. Um, that's for our SROs and our buildings our care teams, and to upgrade our buildings um, to keep, you know, to do those improvements. Um, and like we said, the last one is the building fund that's almost done at this point. Um, the other big chunk of money we receive is that state money that I spoke about. It's called the State Foundation. Uh, in a couple weeks here in Ohio, we will be electing a new governor. And one of his first tasks is to create the new biennium budget that starts July 1st of 2019. When, new, when governors are elected when they're new, they actually are given an extension of when they have to put their first, um, their first draft out there for public consumption. They actually are given until March 15th. Um, but that certainly won't be the day that we're going to know anything because if you remember in the past, they all get picked apart and it changes probably 20 times before the June 30th deadline. Um, there, there's actually a new funding formula that's going to be introduced by our representatives, Cup and Patterson, and they're having a regional meeting that I'm attending tomorrow. Um, these two representatives from the House have been working with superintendents and treasurers um, around the state to come up with a different, basically an overhaul of how schools are funded right now. Um, it's very, it's tied very closely to um, wealth and disadvantaged students versus just a flat dollar amount per kid. Um, so it, that'll be interesting to see. This, those, the Cup and Patterson budget is actually being supported by um, the state representatives of BASA, OASBO, and OSBA, which are the three main school um, organizations. So they've been working really closely with them and they are planning on introducing this as an alternative to the way that schools have been funded in the past. So I have a feeling that once it all hits the fan, it'll probably be a combination of what the new governor wants, what the legislation wants, and, um, but Representative Cup and Patterson are very well respected in the states, especially regarding school funding. So I have imagined they will have a big part of that as well. So the deadline um, for us to know is June 30th of what will happen, but the problem with that is the very next day is when the new budget starts. So when we kind of get to these points in the forecast, we kind of hold our breath a little bit because um, we really don't know what's gonna happen and we could really be given a day's notice of what our funding could look like. Um, the last two years, green was flatlined. Um, the second year we received $32 more than we had the year before. So $32, <laughs> well, I thought it was a misprint when it happened, but it wasn't. <laughs> so, um, and the only thing else that happens in this line item is the casino revenue comes, um, and it has to be receded into here. And currently, as it has been for several years now, it's approximately 50, $52 per student. So, um, so that leaves just 6% of the other revenue that's left. Um, I know a big topic, and we've talked about it quite a bit, is the pipeline. Um, I was at a meeting last Thursday, and I actually um, had lunch with one of the attorneys 
who said um, absolutely she still would not include the pipeline revenue in our five-year forecast. There are um, some things coming down the pike where this revenue might actually put into a permanent improvement type of fund and it would never hit the general fund. Um, and it's one of those that it will be a board of education choice of where the, the revenue will be receded in. Um, with the Nexus pipeline, the very first possible assessment could happen in January of 19 if it's up and running by December of 18 um, with actual gas flowing through it. Um, they said more likely it will be January of 2020. Something that's recently happened um, is the Ohio Department of Education, like anyone else, has budgets they have to stick with. Um, and several years ago, they had this Ohio Revised Code that's listed up there, 3317, um, and it was used for the Perry School District. Um, if you remember in the news, the Perry School District lost millions and millions of dollars because their power plant went under, so it was closed. So ODE made this rule with the legislators that if you lost 10% or more of your valuation, it would protect the entity from losing all of that aid all at one time. Well, unfortunately, ODE, um, because they have to stick to their own budgets, um, they're now saying that if these pipelines are assessed at more, and it, in, it increases our assessed value by more than 10%, that they will reduce our state aid in that same year. Okay. Um, and the, the other bad part about this is that they won't do that until May or June of that fiscal year. So they could potentially take a large chunk of revenue that we receive in state aid in the same year um, without any warning to the school district if they implement this. There are um, school districts that are a year or two ahead of us that they have rover pipelines and they're kind of holding their breath because Ohio Department of Education said that they will likely put this ORC into effect to reduce their state aid, but not tell them the amount until the end of the fiscal year they're in. Um, so it gets a little murky, and I'll try to do my best. In 2020, green local schools will be on the guarantee. That means that um, we cannot be funded less than we are in the year that we're in. So for 2020, if that pipeline opens and they try to reduce the state aid, they wouldn't be able to because we're on the guarantee. We can't lose money. We are a very rare school district that in this five-year forecast, we jump from the guarantee to being what they call a formula district, which means they're truly funded at the number of kids we have, to a cap district. I, the, the people that help me with this five-year forecast, they tell me I'm one of five that they know of that actually hit all three of those scenarios in one five-year forecast. So the reason I say that is because if this does happen, in 2021, we're actually a formula district, which means we could potentially lose revenue from this ORC if they implement it across the state. I, um, I explained in, in May, our original estimate is for the pipeline revenue would be 850,000 to a million dollars annually. Um, this pipeline is automatically depreciated by 15% each year. So in year six, it will be at the minimum of 15% value that it is on day one. Um, the other thing that we've talked about in the past that I just wanna go over one more time is that um, the pipeline value is self-reported. Um, I've used the example, it'd be as if someone came to your house where you live and they say, well, what do you want your house to be worth? And then that's what we're gonna bill you on. The pipeline, they are self-reporting their value of their pipeline. So they, they have the potential, and I'm not saying that they will, but they could have the potential of grossly underestimating what the value of the pipeline is to reduce their tax bill to the school district and to the city and the other entities that receive money from the pipeline. Um, they're working on putting rules into place so that won't happen. Um, and I'm not clearly not saying that that will happen, but it is tough to to swallow when you say, okay, well, what do you want your pipeline to be worth? So that's how much money green schools gets. Um, so it's been, it's been quite a, it's kind of one of the reasons why every attorney tells me, don't you dare put that in the forecast because who knows what's gonna happen with it really. So um, the other, the good part of this, um, this part is that um, about 
18 months ago, we really started looking at how to invest our money better. How could we, um, you know, we had some liquid money that we actually could invest. And if you know school treasurers, we're all a little nervous about that kind of stuff. Um, but so I broke the money up in the past year into commercial paper, um, which is a nine month investment. So there is a penalty if we had to pull that money out before the nine months comes up. Um, we recently, with Home Savings Bank, started a money market account. The really nice thing about that is it's same day liquidity. As long as I do it by two o'clock, the money can go back to the main account that same day. And we have Star Ohio. Um, Star Ohio is uh, a state of Ohio run investment, and that's a 24 hour liquidity. So basically, if I needed the money out of there, I, I could get the money the next day back into our account. Um, so just to make a kind of uh, comparison, I wanted to see, so I ran the report of from September of 2017 to September of 18, how much money did we receive in investments? And we received $83,802 in investment dollars yeah. for the district. That's great. So awesome. that's my yay moment. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so on the other side of the forecast, the revenues go at the top, the top third of the forecast, and you can see on the ODE's website or on our website tomorrow, you can pull up the forecast in itself. The second half of the forecast is our expenditures. Um, you can see from this graph, which the, the blue is salaries for a school district and the orange is the benefits, the fringe benefits, including their retirement account and their medical account. So for our school district currently for fiscal year 19, 84% of our salaries um, and fringe benefits are just those two alone. So you think out of 100%, 84% of it right there is just for salary and fringe benefits. Um, typically, what ODE looks at is that percentage to say a typical school district is between 80 and 85% for our salaries and fringe benefits. Anything over 85% is an indicator that additional revenue is needed or that cuts are necessary. Um, I, so I did a little tracking out. Um, it, it looks like in the year 2021, if nothing changes, that would be the year that we actually exceed that 85% mark. Uh, the district currently has three unions in the districts. Um, we have negotiated agreements in effect for all three unions through 2020, uh, well, June 30th, 2020. Um, and also with two of the three unions, um, GEA and Glass, there is a possible rollover of a uh, fourth year if both sides agree. So there wouldn't be any openers, any changes to language. Um, it's just both sides have to vote one more time. Do you want to have the rollover or not? Um, in this fiscal year, um, starting just now in July, we added two and a half new teachers, um, three new special education aides, and one uh, new supervisor in the district. We have been in the Stark County COG. Um, since about six months after I got here. Um, we joined in fiscal year 11. In this fiscal year, we have three premium holidays, meaning that um, both the district and the employees do not have to pay um, for their, that month of their medical insurance. Um, this year, we also had a 6.75% increase of the premium. <coughs> Typical increases for premiums for other um, entities that you can join are typically between 12 and 15 percent a year. We've been really lucky um, and if you check it out on the website I have a list since fiscal year 11 of what the increases have been um, and 6.75 has actually been the highest we've had um, since fiscal year 11. Um, each holiday for the school district is worth approximately $665,000. So as, as wonderful as the, the premium holidays are um, it's, it's a part where in the forecast you struggle a little bit to decide what to put in there because, you know, just one holiday more is worth that much more. So getting three holidays this year, you can see, is quite a bit of money um, and a swing is a positive nature for us. Um, so we follow the advice um, mostly of what the Stark County COG asks us to put in. They ask you to put in um, no holidays and a 10% increase. Um, in the forecast that is presented tonight, there is one holiday for each year implemented in the forecast, 
and a 10% increase. Um, I still feel that's really conservative, but I also feel it's a little more transparent um, from my end since um, the district I was in previously, I was also in the Stark County COG and we always had at least one holiday there as well. We did have years where we only had one, but I have never in the 15 years I've been affiliated with the Stark County COG, we've never had a year with zero. So that's why, that, that's just a discussion that I've had with board members and that's where we've left that for now. Um, the rest of it is purchase service and supplies. Um, purchase services are made up mostly of utility costs, professional development for staff, repairs, and memberships. Um, the other large part of that is um, in the state foundation, they account for students that leave the district um, leaving for open enrollment to other schools, they go to STEM schools, they go to community schools, or um, special ed students can receive scholarships to attend um, higher needs districts um, for their disability. And the district, um, this, this alone costs us a million dollars for these students to go. It's just a little over a million dollars um, for these students to leave the district. The last part, and all the, most of the principals left, I guess, I was gonna toot their horn a little bit because the supplies um, for the whole district are just 3% of the entire general fund budget. Um, and I can tell you that in the past 25 years of me doing this, this group of building principals and teachers have, they, they watch their pennies and they make sure that they don't go over their budgets. They use fundraisers, they get local grants every moment that they can get. They use consortium pricing. Um, we've joined on the Amazon Prime bandwagon. And we get a lot of things from them at a very deep discount that's um, special for government entities, above and beyond what you and I can get from Amazon on a daily basis. Um, and so I can tell you that um, they really do a great job keeping in their budgets. Um, I, don't, I just wanted to thank them for that because I know it's hard sometimes with what the only 3% that they have. Um, just as a note, this forecast for fiscal year 19 um, has changed. It's actually less than half of 1% from what you saw in May. So, um, you know, sometimes unexpected things happen, but we were lucky to know what the premium holiday was going to be, and we do a pretty good job of keeping our eye on the ball. So it didn't change very much since May at all. Um, and I know that you know, if, if you pay attention to um, the forecast in detail, you'll see that beginning in 2020, um, the district will begin deficit spending. Deficit spending means that you're spending more than you're receiving. Um, this will be the first time we've done that in five years. But I also want to note that there's a lot of things that we talked about tonight that we don't know about. We don't know about the new biennium budget. We don't know about the premium holidays, and we don't know about the pipeline revenue. All of those things more than likely will be in our favor and will push out the need um, for cuts or for additional funding way farther than I'm hoping. So I know it's, it's alarming sometimes when you get to this couple next slides I have and you see a, a negative number in the last couple of years, um, but we're really lucky and what we've done in the last 10 years since I've been here to really get this where we want it to be. And Mr. Miller and I, um, we, we haven't ignored the fact that we start deficit spending in 2020. We've had two meetings about it already, talking about what will we do? Are we going to have attrition? Will we need new money? What will we, what will we ask the board of um, to be able to keep off the ballot as much as we possibly can? This slide here, I don't expect you to read any of the numbers. I'm, I'm, this is just a visual, and I'm gonna give you the numbers in the next slide. So, before Mr. Campbell starts yelling at me, I know you can't read the number, but I wanted you at least to visually see um, the black line is the total revenue of the district. That's your guaranteed money, not money that needs to be renewed. That's just money we know we have. Um, the gray line is your expenses, so money going out. The peach the peach line that you see in the last uh, four years or so, that is the levies that are going to expire. So that, that kind of shows you visually what will happen to that revenue if those levies aren't renewed. And the little yellow line, as you can see, that goes 
itself, um, that's your cash balance for the years. So um, once you'll see in the next slide, that yellow line with that box at the end has a negative number of $10 million. Um, that's your year five in your forecast. And that's if nothing changes, we don't do anything. Mr. Miller and I just sit around and wait. <laughs> that's what will happen, <laughs> So, which isn't going to happen, so don't worry. And Mr. Jackson's favorite part of his presentation every year is because he knows this is the last slide. This is the cash balances um, per year that goes out um, to OVE. Um, if you have, if you obviously have a negative in year one or two, ODE shows up at my door in a week from now. Um, if you have a positive balance in year three, you don't even, they don't even pay any attention to you. Um, year three, if you had a negative there, they would ask you to write a plan, um, the school district, and they would ask that the superintendent and treasurer um, write out a plan of how they were going to make that number a positive. And because there's so many unknowns and there's two biennium budgets just within this forecast, if you have a negative number in the year four and five, um, to them, you're doing pretty good. So they leave us alone. We won't even hear from them. So that's it. So if we win the Mega Millions, we're set for a while. <laughs> right. 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 Office pool. <laughs> yeah. I have one quick question. Just on the last slide, the, the negative 10 million, that is uh, not including renewal levies. Correct. No, no, that's assuming that the renewals will both be passed as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Assuming that. If they wow. don't pass, that number becomes. Uh, I think it was larger. minus Mark, 16 much, million. <laughs> much right. larger. That was um, the official statement. We'll have a new update it prior, says right prior to that. <laughs> ending balances without levies, it's a lot. Yeah. Okay. It's 16 and 31. So. I just had a quick question concerning the pipeline money. Uh, the, you know, the projection, I know, obviously, it's all pie-in-the-sky stuff, and sure. a lot of things can change. Uh, projection of eight 850000 to a million possible revenue, the uh, state aid, would that be dollar-for-dollar dollar reduction, or is that, as they're talking, to change that ORC? No, it would so be. It would still potentially be a, be a net gain of something? Oh, sure. Absolutely. So it's dollar-for-dollar? Dollar. No. It would be about 35%. Of the loss. So if you get a million, mm -hmm. you take away 350000 Correct. Correct. Okay. And I just want to point out, too, that, you know, even with that negative of 2.3, you know, with your conservative estimates in your five-year forecast, you just go with the average. Our average uh, holiday for just the insurance premium is like 2.25, I think I calculated over the last, mm -hmm. since we've been part of the COG. Uh, I mean, you add that holiday in as the average, and... 22 is in a positive number already. Uh, right, because we've had, like I said, since I've been in the district, we've had two or more. And I, what I did for, this was fun for me, I guess, but I put in two for the whole time, and that number in 22 was in a positive number. And we've not had less than two since I've been here. And in and, and my previous district, so for 15 years, I haven't seen it be less than two. Yeah, I know. It's, a, it's just a really big, scary number, obviously, to see yeah. $10 million back in uh, fiscal year 23, which, like, to your point, there's many things that we can do as a district, uh, as the state can change. Uh, so I guess if I'm the public looking at that, do not be alarmed that we are not going to be $10 million in the whole five years from now. Uh, and obviously us as you know, mm -hmm. superintendent and treasurer and, and everyone here will be working, obviously, diligently and looking at the issues on how we can keep that number down. Yes. And thanks, I appreciate uh, everything you've done. It's a lot of work to put this in. Thank you. Uh, just a couple quick, just clarification things. You know, I think we always talk about the emergency levies versus continuing mm -hmm. emergency is all dollar based. Um, rather than using the word emergency, it could just be the $4.1 million. Um, on the permanent improvement, the 4.8 mill levy, it's not $4.8 million, it's 4.8 mills that result in less, there's a little bit less than $3 million, is that, or a little it's, bit more? It's than three just million. a little over $3 million okay. that we collect for that a year, correct. And then the, um, uh, so the bond issue also then, when that expires, does that mean we, you know, had the, the mortgage burning and all that big ceremony, we own all of our buildings, right. we, we right. don't owe anything else? Correct. Right? And your tax bill will go down a little bit. 
which is always a good thing. <laughs> um, as far as the, since some of the principals are back, I would like for you to reiterate what you said, because I never thought I'd hear these words come out of your mouth, and I guarantee you they know the same thing. No, nope. now they have to go watch the whole thing over again <laughs> from the very beginning. <laughs> There's a lot, of, a lot of love being spread for the principals, uh, building principals and teachers have used fundraisers, grants to keep uh, budgets in the black for the past 10 years. That is a direct comment from the treasurer. I know at the beginning there was no way you'd ever think that she would say that, <laughs> but I just wanted to make sure you heard that uh, just like we did, because I kind of had to like, whoa, wait a minute. I she can never be nice says that. sometimes. That's <laughs> Every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, uh, but certainly a great job. But I think it just shows like the whole team is Absolutely. really doing a great job in terms of watching, you know, every dollar. We know we have to spend money, and we just, but there's nothing that says we can't spend it efficiently and spend it wisely. As far as the timeline for the renewal levies, um, you know, in the time that I've been uh, up here and, and some of you as well, it's gone from this weird thing of, uh, well, a good thing that you could wait until you had the levy results and then if you needed to put it on for the next time, you could do that. Now it's kind of some, it's uh, whoever came up with this great idea that they were gonna have to put it vote to put it on the ballot prior to the ballot being done the first time and everything else. So could you maybe walk us through a timeline for the 2019, um, the 4.1 mil, mm -hmm. $4 million dollar levy that expires at the end of 2019? Sure. So um, the way it works is the Board of Education, um, they would have two separate readings. Um, the first one is actually to say, yes, we want to go back. Um, it, the way they first set it up was before they had emergency levies. Like you mentioned, emergency levies are fixed sum, so they're a dollar amount. So it sounds silly to say the first reading is to go say, yes, the board wants to think about this still. You, Mr. County Auditor or Mrs. County Auditor, how much would that bring in? Well, it's silly for us because we already know the answer, but if you were going on the ballot for, say, um, a certain millage, say you wanted to go for five mils, if you weren't at the floor like we are, then that's where they go to you. And we kind of did that with the safety and security levy where we said, well, we're going to go for one mil. Now you tell me what one mil is. Well, one mil to us is completely different than it is to Coventry, to Manchester, to Akron. Every school district's different because it's based on your assessed value. So for us, one million dollars, or a one mil levy is $777,000. So that's the first step. Um, the second step then is I bring that paper paperwork back and I say to the board, okay, this is how much you would get. Do you still want to do this? And that's where you decide yes or no. Depending on the type of levy it is, depends on how many yes votes you actually need. Um, and so the first <coughs> time for fiscal year 19 or calendar year 19, excuse me, um, is the May election. So the May election, all of those steps have to be finished and turned into the Board of Elections by February 6th. So um, our bond council, you know, we, we, we talked about a timeline with the bond council. I talked to him again this morning of, um, you know, when possible, we try to keep them on our regular Board of Education meetings. So they would need to be done um, the first reading in the December board meeting and the second one in the January board meeting. So um, certainly there have been time crunches in the past where you can call special board meetings and that's pretty normal actually. Um, but that's an option of just keeping them in the regular board meetings to go the first reading in December, the second in January. So everybody should anticipate in December that we would be putting that first reading on mm -hmm. and, and then voting on that just so that, and, and it kind of works in our in our, our quest for being transparent to make sure that everybody knows what's going on because we know that there's a group of people that leave, um, you know, my mom, for example, that goes to Florida from January to the end of April and they come back and now all of a sudden they're faced with a, with a ballot issue. So we want to make sure that, the, that they're seeing that timeline as well. Um, and as far as the election cycles go, May and November are pretty much the two primary ones. The primaries are, and yeah. then we'll uh, and then we'll go uh, mm -hmm. with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, there was one other thing. Oh, so on the on the other levies that you talked about and that they're all in, in they're all separate. Are they also um, 
in separate accounts when somebody would log on to look at any of our financials and stuff, would those be uh, like a 001? I know that's something else, but for example, would that be in a, in a special account that Each you could see? Each one has their own phone number. And you could see every mm -hmm. yeah. in and out uh, uh, on that on that particular account for those for Each those one things. is separate, okay. a separate fund and they're restricted. And, and they're audited separately by the auditor each year to make sure that, you know, it's only for those expenses that the voters approved for. Okay, excellent. Um, and one half of 1%, you're slipping a little bit, I think. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, no. Uh, I know, funny. It's those um, people. <laughs> that, that truly is amazing on a $55 million budget, right? I think that's uh, I think that's pretty darn impressive. As a matter of fact, maybe in a round of applause for that is what I think. Oh, yeah. I know she loves that, but I think it's worth it. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? I just want to thank Mrs. Snowberger um, for all the hard work on the on the uh, budget forecast. I know it's it's really hard in your line of work to kind of make it understandable for people like me who aren't very good with numbers. Um, and I appreciate it, and we're so lucky in this district to have what I think is the best treasurer in the state of Ohio uh, working for this school. So, I just wanted to make one more comment. I know I get a lot of questions asked. You know, when we passed the levy in 2011, I think that was the 4.8 million mm -hmm. levy. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, as you look at our five-year forecast, and you see that negative number approaching, people always say, "Well." What did you do with that $5 million? How, it's going to be 10, 12 years, and it's gone. Uh, and people just don't understand that it's a fixed dollar amount. Uh, so if you want to just picture your own budget, if you're making $50,000 a year in 2011, and you get no raise at all, you're making $50,000 in 2023, your insurance goes up, your electric bill goes up, gas prices go up. So all the expenses continue to go up, but your income stays the same. So eventually, there's going to be a, a time where you're going to be underwater. So just for people to understand, you know, a lot of people think that we, we waste money or, you know, we gave you all that money and where did it all go? It, it's not like we're not being diligent and watching every penny that goes. It's just a matter of math that if you have a set dollar amount, everything goes up. I don't, I don't know anybody that's bills have not gone up in their household every year. Uh, so it's just something to to think about when you if there is you know ever a levy obviously a new levy would have to come on at some point obviously we'd like to push it out as far as possible but uh, the reason that we need more money is that's that's the reason we are have a set amount of dollars and eventually our expenses outweigh you know our our insurance goes up every year you, you just went through that with the six percent which is obviously a lot lower than a lot of other insurances but that goes up the, the electric bill goes up Obviously, our great staff deserve raises like every other person that does a great job. Uh, so raises are included in those, too. So, and you look at salaries and benefits, that's 85% of our budget. So as those go up and the amount of money that we bring in stays the same, eventually that's going to run out. So I just want people to try to understand where, where that money goes and uh, just to have a little better understanding of, of how that works. And can I just tag on to what Mr. Hurdlick was saying? Because this is my favorite thing to say, so I, I would not want to miss a chance to say it again. It, we also need to, to remind folks that we have far exceeded the number of years that was talked about when we did pass that new money levy. Um, by, that was 2017, we had said that would it, la it would last till then. And now we're looking into potentially 2022 ish although you know with the way taxes are collected and things we may have to go a little sooner than that just so that we collect it in the the appropriate time frame so um, i think that's something to to also keep in mind is if we if we have made good on that promise and beyond sure. very good point yep. all right moving right along uh the approval of the minutes do i have a motion to approve the regular board meeting of september 27th 2018 so moved thank Second. you mrs stornoff and thank you mr hurdlick Mrs. Snowberger? Mrs. Stoinoff? Yes. Mr. Herdlick? Yes. Mrs. Finelli? Yes. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Mr. Campbell? Yes. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. The superintendent and treasurer recommend the Board of Education approve the financial report and payment of bills as presented by the treasurer. Do I have a motion to approve that? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Second. Thank you, Mrs. Finelli. Mrs. Snowberger? Mr. Cohen? 
Yes. Mrs. Finelli? Yes. Mr. Herdlick? Yes. Mrs. Doinoff? Yes. Mr. Campbell? Yes. Motion carries five to zero. Item B, the superintendent and treasurer recommend the Board of Education approve the five-year forecast and notes as presented by the treasurer. Do I have a motion to approve that? So moved. Thank Second. Mr. Herdlick, and thank you, Mrs. Stoinoff. I just have 17 more questions. <laughs> no, <I'm> just, <laughs> Mrs. Stoinoff. Mr. Herdlick? Yes. Mrs. Stoinoff? Yes. Mr. Campbell? Yes. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Mrs. Finelli? Yes. Motion carries five to zero. Uh, item C, the superintendent and treasurer recommend the Board of Education approve the following donations to the Bulldog Dash Fund. Um, I'm just going to read them all because I think it's important that we read them all. I know it's yes. going to take a little long. I won't put the amounts on, but I'm just going to list everybody that's on there. From Compass North Church, Spoonhauer Orthodontics, Boggs Chiropractic, George and Rama uh, Hanna, Excel Learning, Kathleen McClellan, Laura and Larry Beard, Bulldog Barbers, uh, Harpst, Ross, and Becker, Ken's Auto Service, Sweet Frog and Green, Barrington Carpet and Flooring, Marhofer Chevrolet, Green Baseball Softball Federation, Lakes Heating and Air Conditioning, Cutler Real Estate, J Rail Transport, uh, Tana DeShane, Paulus Orthodontics, Royalty Roofing, and Richard and Melody Sanner. Um, do I have a motion to uh, approve the donations, acceptance of, the don of those donations? So moved. Thank you, Mrs. Finelli. Second. And thank you, Mr. Cohen. Um, I just wanted to mention that we received lots and lots of um, additional donations. Um, the way that the board policy reads is that any donation of $500 or more is listed um, on a, an agenda for approval. But I did want to at least, you know, say it out loud one more time that there were lots and lots of other donors um, to this Bulldog Dash, and they always come back year after year to give to this um, fund and I think it's great. So I just wanted there to say that. Yeah. Awesome. Do we have anybody that was at the Bulldog Dash or that was would like to say something about maybe what happened after the Bulldog Dash? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Who might that be? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you did clean up nicely though. I did. I did. <laughs> So uh, uh, last week we took uh, five pies of the face, and uh, it was a great event, and we just really appreciate the community support. So that's awesome. Do we have a total? Uh, it was sixty. Another record-setting total this year, wasn't it? Sixty thousand, right? I, I think we're about. I think we're about fifty-seven, fifty-eight. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Were you able to choose the flavor of pie? Was that ready with? <laughs> and I will not be able to eat uh, pumpkin pie for Thanksgiving this year. <laughs> You're a very good sport, all you guys are. No, we, thank you. Thank you for that impromptu one. Mrs. Snowberger. Mrs. Finelli? Yes. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Mr. Campbell? Yes. Mrs. Soinoff? Yes. Mr. Herdlick? Yes. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Item D, the superintendent and treasurer recommend the Board of Education approve the Ohio Safety Training Grant, Fund 019, in the amount of $22,775.15 and add to the permanent appropriations. This grant is funded by the state of Ohio and to be used only for training of school resource officers. Do I have a motion to approve that? So moved. I'm oh, sorry. Second. Thank you, Mr. Cohen and Mrs. Stoinoff. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Snowberger, do you have anything, or Mr. Miller, do you have anything just to add on that grant? It pretty much says that this is a grant that came from the state of Ohio, and uh, as it states here, it's to use for training specifically. So obviously, we would want to utilize it to the best of our abilities. So we're still exploring some of the different options that we would have to maximize those funds, but. Uh, you know, certainly it's not going to uh, not be utilized. Is there a uh, deadline for us to use that money? It's June 30th. June 30th. Of 19. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Snibber? Mr. Cohen? Yes. Mrs. Stoinoff? Yes. Mr. Herdlick? Yes. Mrs. Finelli? Yes. Mr. Campbell? Yes. Motion carries 5 to 0. Thank you. Under new business, the consent calendar note. Items under the consent calendar are considered routine to be enacted under one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items prior to the time the board votes, unless a board member requests an item be clarified or even removed from the consent calendar for separate action. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the consent calendar as presented? So moved. Second. Thank you, Mrs. Finelli, and thank you, Mrs. Stoinoff. 
questions or comments? Uh, so there are some first readings on here, and many of those, as we've stated in the past, are required, um, which is why we update our policies. But I have asked Mrs. Bruick just to go over um, a few of them and highlight uh, a few of these uh, changes and the rationale behind them. Good evening. Um, as Mr. Miller indicated, there are a number of policies that are being uh, put on the agenda this evening for first reading, um, then again in November for hopefully a final approval and adoption by the Board of Education. Many of those, of course, are to make sure that our policies are compliant with the Ohio Department of Education and the Ohio Revised Code and any administrative codes that have been um, put forth by the legislature and approved. There are some, however, that we wanted to draw your attention to. Um, the uh, policy 4162, the drug and alcohol testing of CDL license holders and other employees who perform safety sensitive functions. Obviously, we want our employees to be in um, a good state of mind and state of health when they are performing, particularly those people who are responsible for uh, the care and transportation of our students. Uh, this policy revision requires that we provide educational materials to any of the individuals that we hire to work in those supportive positions, such as uh, school bus drivers, school bus aides, um, anybody in our transportation department, and anyone who might, um, might operate uh, heavy equipment on a regular basis as a function of their employment. Uh, the other thing is that uh, return to duty uh, requirements have changed a little bit and there is a now, uh, now a return to duty or fitness test that um, an individual who may have violated this policy would need to go through um, uh, to, to make sure that they are uh, capable of performing their, their work responsibilities. Uh, the other uh, policies that I wanted to draw your attention to um, have to do with uh, your policy numbers 5610 and 5610.02 and those deal with student discipline. Uh, many of these are the direct result of some of the attendance policies uh, that we have been seeing change as a result of House Bill 410 that was passed into law last year. Um, the one notable change is to our policy is that any student who is suspended out of school for any length of time now may have the opportunity to complete makeup work that they miss. That has not been uh, board policy in years past. That is now a requirement and so we want to make sure that we um, have an update to our policy that reflects that requirement. The same thing holds for in-school suspension. Although the board um, has a policy in place currently that uh, allows students who are in an in-school suspension placement or an alternative education placement to complete work um, that they would miss uh, as a result of not being in the classroom but being in an alternative placement on school property. So that policy, the procedures and the, the guidelines that we follow currently uh, are consistent with the changes that we're going to be making to the policy. We are simply stating outright in the policy now that that work can be made up and should be made up. Um, along with that, there have been some changes to uh, suspensions and expulsions uh, where pre-K to three students are involved. Um, students now in grades pre-K through three may be emergency removed for the remainder of a school day. Um, but they are required to attend a hearing the following day with their parents. They may not be suspended or expelled without the, the, the hearing taking place. And uh, furthermore, there is no suspension or expulsion of a student unless no immediate suspension or expulsion without a hearing and without the due process uh, unless an, a firearm or knife is present. Um, an adult crime has been committed that involves injury or there's an immediate health, the immediate uh, health and safety of, of individuals that are in attendance or working for the school district is jeopardized. Um, as far as the policy uh, 6320 is concerned with purchasing and bidding, uh, this policy language will be compliant uh, not only with uh, federal regulations and state regulations, but now uh, it will also be a reflection of our current practice. Uh, that we have been observing in the district for several years now, um, I think primarily since Mrs. Snowberger joined us uh, with regard to quotes and bidding, um, those types of things. Uh, the 
second to last policy that I'd like to highlight this evening is policy 8141, mandatory reporting of misconduct by licensed employees. Um, up until recently, the school district and the superintendent has had the, uh, the authority to make a, a determination about whether or not to refer uh, an employee to the Ohio Department of Education's Office of Professional Conduct. In this case, there are certain um, actions or inactions or behaviors uh, that require us to report to the Office of, Miscon uh, to the Office of Professional Conduct. And then finally, the, 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 the hot new topic in public schools in Ohio these days, well, in fact, all around the country, um, deal with school resource officers. Uh, we are putting forth uh, policy 8403. Uh, it is a new policy, and it, regard, it, is, uh, with regarding, uh, it re is regarding school resource officers. Uh, the duties of the school resource, the resource officers will be to promote safety, to conduct law enforcement activities, to educate, to be positive role models, to assist with crime prevention, to implement emergency management plans, and to follow a specific chain of command. In other words, when they are working on school property or as a function of the school district, they are to report to the building administrator or to the superintendent. If they are off property and not functioning in their capacity as a school resource officer, they may be working separately overtime work for the sheriff's department or something like that, then they will report directly uh, to the Summit County Sheriff. Are there any questions? Fantastic. Thank you. Mrs. Snowberger? Mrs. Vanelli? Yes. Mrs. Stoinoff? Yes. Mr. Campbell? Yes. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Mr. Herdlick? Yes. Motion carries five to zero. Um, oh, I, I should have said I did have one, one just a clarification. The policy doesn't isn't the MOU that we're working on or the contract that we're working on with Summit County Sheriff. Just correct to give people an update on that. Yep. This is just how we're going to employ them and, and yeah. This is upholding the the required operational policy. side of it. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Item B, the superintendent and treasurer recommend the Board of Education approve additional change orders in the amount of $8,569.36 from Perrin Asphalt for parking lot work at Green Middle and Intermediate Schools. Do I have a motion to approve that? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Cohn. Second. And thank you, Mr. Herdlick. Questions or comments? Yeah, just quickly, um, obviously the board approved that project and um, when it was approved, everything that could be viewed and looked at and examined uh, came out that's what you guys ultimately approved in the process of the project once you get down into the asphalt we found some catch basins that from the surface looked like they were okay and they weren't so we had um, more than a few of those that needed replaced and then once you get and, and I'm gonna pretend like I know what I'm talking about with this but <laughs> the subgrade features which is underneath the surface of asphalt asphalt the part you can't see that was um, obviously had deteriorated so that needed to be fixed as well so what you see there uh, represents some of the overages that came from those so all that with a fairly minimal overage is pretty yeah pretty impressive, it, pretty impressive. Thank, thank you mrs snowberger oh yeah mr cohen yes <laughs> i'm just daydreaming sorry mr herdlick yes Mrs. Stoinoff? Yes. Mr. Campbell? Yes. Mrs. Vanelli? Yes. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Um, board accommodations, if we have any public. Oh, we have to uh, I think we have a couple that are waiting to speak patiently. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> That's all right. We do that up here, too. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Valerie Nash, and I'm with Summit County Children's Services. And we're here just to provide some education to this board and this community about issue eight, which we have on the ballot here in 15 days. Um, so it's right around the corner. Listening to uh, Ms. Snowberg speak, I, I was kind of replaying in my head, while this tune sounds very, very similar to the reality that we're facing at Summit County Children's Services. So we're actually on the ballot for a dual issue as one issue eight. 
Um, it is to renew a 2.25 mil levy with the additional of a one mil levy, so a total of a 3.25. And there's some reason why we chose to do it in that way, and, and again, some of which was already alluded to here. The 2.25, um, doing it as a renewal, preserves that homestead rollback tax, so it actually saves taxpayers 12.5% over the course of the, the years of this levy, which is um, six years. So when we add then the additional to that, then in six years when we go back to the voters, the entire, entire 3.25 uh, mil will be a renewal and again preserving that homestead rollback tax. We've also done some projections um, out and what we believe um, can happen is that over the course of two levy cycles, so a total of 12 year period, this one mil additional will carry us through that 12 years. So in six years, when we go back to the voters, we will not be asking for more money at that time. It'll just be that total renewal of 3.25. We serve one in 12 um, children in Summit County, which can sometimes seem to be a bit ba um, baffling and daunting. Um, but we are actually in every school district. We are, we are involved in every corner of this county. And unfortunately, the state of Ohio funds us 50th in the nation in terms of child protection. So we are the lowest funded state, and that requires us to come to our, our local constituents and ask them to help support us. The additional one mil combined with the uh, 2.25 will allow us to really continue services as they are. Right now, um, as of this morning, we have 300, or 791 children in our custody. Those children have to go someplace. So we don't remove children, we physically take them, but it is the courts and it is law enforcement who actually have the authority to remove children from their parental custodians. And then they hand them to us and ask us to take care of them. That means we've gotta find a place to put them. More often than not, we are fortunate that we're able to place with kin, meaning someone who's within their familial um, relationship or a close family member, we even count that as coaches and teachers. In order to do that though, we are fortunate under our current structure to be able to offer those kin support financially and otherwise so that they feel that they can take a new child or in most cases, a group of siblings into their home. So without having this additional plus the renewal of the 2.25, unfortunately we would be cutting major services that our county right now is fortunate to be able to provide. Um, we would see a reduction in staff of about 35% and those services would render us right down to the basic mandates, which are merely investigating allegations of abuse and neglect. So we'd be unable to do all of the additional things that we do right now, working with drug court to reunify families. We really are kind of on the cutting edge in the counties um, for what we do. So most of the other 87 counties look to us as being the one county that will try anything. We put our money where our mouth is and we keep our staff costs as low as possible. And we've reduced staffing over the years to make sure that we're staying within budget. So, you know, we're looking at every penny that we put out and the reality of it is is that we need our constituents we need this community to support us and to vote yes for issue eight come November 6th. Do you have any questions for us? Can I just follow up the comment? Um, in the interest of full disclosure, I want everyone to know that I also sit on Summit County Children's Services Board, so I, I wanna be transparent about that. They are not here because I sit on Summit County Children's Services Board. They've been traveling the county. It just happened to be our <laughs> turn um, that, that they're here. Um, I have to say when Valerie said 791 <laughs> children in custody, which I would have found out tomorrow night, um, I was shocked. So that represents, um, I'm finishing my fourth year on, um, on the board here at the end of December. And when I started, I think we had around 500 and some to 600 um, children yep. in custody. Exactly. And I, I think I just want people to, to understand that the opiate crisis has had a significant impact on what we see um, from from children's services. So this just didn't happen, you know, somehow s s children just started appearing. Um, there, there is a reason um, why. And those um, children unfortunately often come into custody with significant needs because they have been 
exposed to significant traumas. Um, I will never forget the meeting that I sat in when I was told that we had small, very small children who were in a house um, for, for hours, it might have been even a couple of days, with a deceased parent. Um, yeah. So the, the trauma is real and the trauma is significant. So I just wanted to kind of add that. First of all, I wanted to be transparent so everyone knew that because there are people in the community who do know that. So I wanted them to know um, that I am a part of this board, but that um, um, things have changed. And unfortunately, every time I go to the meeting, it's delightful to see Valerie and the others who work very hard. Um, but unfortunately, we don't get to, to talk about the positive things that we get to talk about here because it's, it's real work and it's serious work. So I appreciate you coming Thank to you. share with us. And if you visit our both our Facebook page and our website, supportsummitkids.org, um, we do have both. We have a marriage of both, you know, the positive outcomes that we see both from the youth who've risen up through our, our agency, they've stayed in foster care and they've turned into fantastic citizens, um, to some of the real struggles that folks have right now. And, you know, the people getting into opiate addictions is very different than some other substances that we've known in the past. I mean, it's very easy to see what happens when you're on pain pills. And a lot of our stories are that basic. They happen in, in the most normal of homes. And at the end of the day, we have to find a place to put the children. Grandmas and grandpas aren't equipped to take care of you know two and three and four year olds. And so if we can keep them there with some support, financial, daycare, beds, you know, dressers, things that you don't think you need anymore. Um, that, that goes a long way to keeping that child in at least some familial relationship. And then it also encourages the amount of um, restoration we can for that family. So, and we partner with teachers. I mean, there are number one reference. Um, you know, some school districts more than others, but you know, no school district is immune to making that call to children's services. And so, you know, we know it's there. We, I am aware that the, the board does not endorse, and I understand that. We have that from a lot of places that we've been. I feel like I've been on a speaking tour for the last 30 days. My husband's basically like, what school are you at tonight? We do have individual endorsement forms if anyone would like to have those. Um, you will be getting a mailer, and um, if you, you know, from this community, your name could possibly be listed on that as an individual if you're so interested. So I will leave some literature here. Um, I did actually bring some yard signs if you've not already been hit up. They're in my car, I didn't bring them in the building. Um, but if anyone needs any of the literature or the materials, we'd be happy to provide those to you. And if you have any questions, never hesitate to call us and you have a great resource in Katie right here in the community. Liz Mangan is with me, she works for our agency. She's been both three, caseworker, she's an attorney, and she is our quality improvement director currently. Um, and her children currently go to the green school. So, you know, it's, it's right at home for us, yes. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you very, you very much. much. We appreciate your patience also. Thank you. Oh, no problem. It was <laughs> very interesting, I have to say. I was like, well, we're not the only one in the deficit spending situation. It all made sense. If you need Edie to come make presentations, she loves to t speak publicly. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, do that. <laughs> um, all right, we'll move on to uh, board accommodations. Uh, Mr. Hurtlick, you want to start us out? Sure, thank you, Mr. Campbell. Uh, as our fall, fall sports uh, starts coming to a close, uh, a lot of great uh, awards that have been earned uh, so far this year. Uh, Max Moldovan, our, uh, he is a junior at the high school defending state champion in golf again this year. He's a two-time champion now, back-to-back. -back. Uh, he has joined that elite company of just a couple, uh, one that probably everyone knows. Uh, Jack Nicholas did it back in 56 and 57. So he has obviously joined a very elite group. Uh, so we're very proud of Max uh, and his accomplishment. Uh, that was some tough weather to, to play in over the weekend, too, down there. So uh, very good player, and uh, we're very proud of him here at Green. Uh, also, our girls varsity cross country team uh, won the district uh, match last week. First time in school history that we've had a, a girls uh, cross country team win district. So congratulations to them and good luck to them as they move on to regionals uh, coming up this weekend. Uh, same with our boys cross country team. Uh, eighth grade boys cross country team, uh, they are state champions. So congratulations to them. So there's a couple state champions here uh, for our fall sports. 
Uh, but congratulations to all our fall athletes as uh, those sports start winding down as we move uh, into our winter sports. Uh, also like to congratulate this year's uh, Academy of Scholars winners uh, at the high school, our 9 through 12. We had a little more than 25% of our entire population there at the high school that have a 3.5 grade point average or higher uh, that earned that Academy of Scholar Award, which is sponsored by the uh, Green Schools Foundation. So congratulations to all of them. Uh, Bulldog Dash, just uh, another shout out on another great job. Uh, close to $60,000 going back to Greenwood and, and primary. And, and I think you guys have changed that up a little bit where a little bit goes to the other schools that they signed up, certain athletes uh, that ran. So uh, just a great fundraiser uh, that continues to get better and better with community support and appreciate uh, all the work that goes into to pulling that off because uh, I've run plenty of fundraisers myself and they're not easy uh, and they get harder as they go. So I know it's a lot of work and I appreciate uh, everything that you guys have done. Um, I think that's all I have. I think I'll let spread it out a little bit so you guys can all have something. Thank you, Mr. Hurley. Mr. Cullen. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. A couple crumbs left for you. I appreciate that. Um, congratulations uh, to the uh, girls and boys Green High School soccer teams who made it to the sectional finals. Unfortunately, uh, both teams lost uh, very uh, hard fought games and their season, uh, seasons ended prematurely. Uh, looking forward to seeing what happens uh, with them next, uh, next fall. Congratulations to Green High School senior Elizabeth Howerton to being named a National Merit Commended uh, Scholar, which is fantastic. Um, excellent job, Elizabeth. Um, a uh, reminder that the Green High School Marching Band, thank you to the community concert, will be held tomorrow evening at Green High School uh, at 7 p.m. Uh, and there is no charge uh, for that event. Uh, it's so indoors too, right? Pardon me? Indoors. Um, indoor, right? Yes, in it gym. is absolutely indoors. Uh, yeah. So even if it's cold, make sure you go. Um, musical Theater 789. Uh, presented two shows of Aladdin on October uh, 13th. I was there for both shows. Uh, they did a great job, uh, led by uh, Scott Bannum and Elena Starr, uh, the students from both Green Middle School uh, and freshmen from Green High School performed together for the first time ever. Uh, it's a really neat uh, combination uh, of the talent pools of those three grades. Um, it's a great opportunity uh, for the Green Middle School kids uh, to learn from some of the older kids uh, in, in high school. Uh, it used to be kind of a gap year uh, that our freshmen had uh, in which they weren't doing uh, any kind of performing or any kind of musical theater. Uh, so this is a great way to combine those talent pools uh, and they all learn from each other and it was, it was a great musical. Um, and speaking of musicals, just bear with me for one second. Uh, because we do have a musical uh, coming up uh, at uh, Green High School, of course. Um, Adam's Family uh, is going to be uh, shown uh, in November. Uh, tickets go on sale. Let's see. When do they go on sale? Uh, soon. Uh, oh, they, they go on sale this coming Saturday. Fantastic. Um, I believe the box office will be open uh, weekly. Um, and Monday through Friday, 8 a.m., to 10 a.m. Uh, and 5 p.m. to 8 o'clock p.m. Starting October 29th, uh, tickets are, uh, reserve tickets are $12 uh, and student tickets are $6. That uh, musical will be shown November 15th, uh, 16th and 17th at 7 p.m. Uh, and November 18th at 2 p.m. and that is the weekend before Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, so get your tickets early. Um, the show is going to be fantastic, uh, as uh, they always are. So looking forward to that. And I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Mrs. Spinelli. Well, this week is School Bus Safety Week. And special thanks to all of our drivers and our subs and our mechanics who keep our buses rolling day to day, which is a, a tough job. Uh, thank you to those drivers who assisted with numerous safety drills and practices and practiced evacuations over the last uh, few weeks also. And I'd like to also acknowledge the efforts that has gone into improving the Reading Buddies uh, program, which is now Learning Buddies. We have 19 buddies who will be working one-on-one -on -one with students at Green Primary School and will now include both math and reading. And I have to laugh, laugh about, 
about this a little bit because when I went to Green Primary School to read to the kids the questions that they ask, the teachers work hard to, to make them ask the right questions, especially for a board member, what do you do on the board? And they asked me how old I was and how much did I weigh. <laughs> I will never forget that. It was, I thought it was a cute thing. What did you say? <laughs> I said I was 39. And my granddaughter said, no, she's not. She's 60 something. <laughs> anyway, and thanks to Pat Angeletti and Green Primary School Counselor Corinne Bentley for their leadership, and April Vogley and Pam Steinkirchner for their time helping to train the volunteers. And would also like to recognize our four new school resource officers who attended a special autism training class designed specifically for law enforcement and first responders. And that's it. Thank you, Mrs. Spinelli. Mrs. Stoyle? Just wanted to remind everyone that the high school, I believe, band boosters, um, the <coughs> craft show, sorry, it went out of my mind <laughs> just that quick, is going to be on November, Saturday, November 3rd. Doors open at 9 o'clock. Um, it is a wonderful place to get little Christmas gifts. I highly recommend some of the baked goods that are also sold along the way. You can grab lunch. So um, all kinds of fun and excitement to be had there. Uh, the following Saturday, you can also um, take part in the Green Middle School <coughs> PTSA quarter auction. Uh, doors open at 12. I believe tickets are on sale in the office. Jeff, is that true? Yeah, okay, so they will be. You may, be, may be able to purchase them ahead of time in the office at Green Middle <coughs> School. Um, it's, a, it's a great um, time, very fun, and a great fundraiser for the middle school PTSA. Um, wanted to um, say thank you to everyone who participated in the career day at Green Intermediate School last week. Um, we had 24 community leaders, elected officials, um, business owners spent most of their day at GIS leading two sessions for career awareness. Uh, Dr. Spoonhauer, Judge Allison Bro, um, veterinarian Dr. Horst, I hope I'm saying that right, um, number of instructors from the PLCC, just name a few people who were there. So also a great big thank you to GIS counselor Lori Morgan for her leadership and many hours putting that event together for our students. Um, appreciation to two new um, family support specialists who um, attended the Akron General Cleveland Clinic Health and Wellness Fair. Many residents who, um, who were levy supporters were enthusiastic to meet and greet um, the ladies and learn a little bit more about our care teams that we've been able to initiate since the passage of the safety levy in August. Our sixth, seventh, and eighth grade bands had the opportunity to visit the Akron Civic Theater for a concert by the Freedom ba Brass Band. Um, the band directed by Tucker Jolly. Um, many of you might be familiar with uh, Mr. Jolly who does the uh, Tuba Christmas every year. Um, is, that band is based in our area and performs brass music for all disciplines and the students really had a great time and loved the show. Um, other than that, I think that's all I have for tonight. All right, thank you Mrs. Stoyle. Um, last thing is the ninth grade boys uh, football. Federal League champs, congratulations to that uh, that group. Awesome job, um, kind of higher, um, raising the bar of expectations as they move up through. So that'll be good. Um, one quick thing that I wanted to mention: uh, not only is uh, well, uh, election day, November sixth. Uh, there were students will have no school, um, and then we'll uh, hopefully everybody will take the opportunity to get out and vote. Uh, on this important uh, midterm election. Um, as far as uh, some legislative things, I would like to uh, just bring it to the attention that the city council will be, um, I believe, is, uh, are going to be uh, voting on the Tobacco 21 legislation uh, tomorrow uh, at their meeting and just on from behalf of the Green Local School District, you know, our no tobacco, no e-cigarette policy uh, on any of our campuses. This is certainly in line with that. Um, there's national statistics about the addictive nature of nicotine and I'm sure that we've all all heard of you know all of those and are still amazed that the number of people that are still smoking and and, and whatnot however um, we do certainly ap uh, appreciate and support any initiative that's going to um, 
is designed to help keep our community and our kids healthy and promote long-term uh, healthy habits for that. So uh, I'd like to commend the, uh, the city council kind of in a little bit of advance, but certainly uh, let them know that how much we appreciate it from the schools and that obviously how uh, our policies align with that. Um, we do have need for an executive session this evening and it's uh, under Ohio Revised Code 121.22 G1 for personnel. We do not anticipate any action uh, to take place afterwards. Do I have a motion to move into executive session? So moved. Thank you, Mrs. Steinoff. And Mr. Herdlick? Mrs. Snowberger? Mrs. Steinoff? Yes. Mr. Herdlick? Yes. Mrs. Finelli? Yes. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Mr. Campbell? Yes. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. And we will see you next time.